Welcome to our first session uh, in today's conference on the economy 2017. As is the custom, uh, this first uh, session tends to take the opportunity to review the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. And so the title of this armchair um, discussion is an economic review of Trinidad and Tobago. The panelists on today's uh, armchair discussion are uh, Mr. Moises Schwartz from the IDB, Dr. Roger Hussein from the Department of Economics here at St. Augustine, and Dr. Anthony Gonzalez, who is no stranger to uh, the Department of Economics and this campus. Mr. Schwartz is a regional economic advisor for the Caribbean Country Department at the IDB. Before coming to the bank in early 2017, he was director of the Independent Evaluation Office at the IMF for seven years. Prior to that, he was president of the National Commission for Retirement Savings in Mexico. Between 2004 and 2006, he served as an executive director at the IMF representing Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Spain, and Venezuela. Previously, he held several senior positions in Mexico's public administration, including finance minister's chief of staff and director general of international financial affairs with the Ministry of Finance in that country. He has also served as Director of Macroeconomic Analysis and Director of Economic Studies at the Bank of Mexico. He earned a bachelor's degree in economics at the Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico and a PhD in economics from the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Roger Hussein is currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics and coordinator of the Trade and Economic Development Unit within that department. He was the lead consultant in the technical design of the government dollar for dollar and the GATE programs. He has worked with several organizations, including the CARICOM Secretariat, the Caribbean Development Bank, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the IDB. He has also collaborated with the majority of multinational energy companies operating here in Trinidad and Tobago. He has written six books, either directly or with co-authors, and he has published over 50 peer-reviewed papers and chapters in peer-reviewed journals. Currently, his research includes corporate social responsibility, localized economic development planning, reveal comparative advantage theory, natural trading partner hypothesis, and the Dutch disease in small petroleum exporting countries. Dr. Anthony Gonzalez, who is in the middle, is a friend of the Department of Economics. He has been a friend for a very long time, uh, having served as a director of the Institute of International Relations on this campus for, 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 for on two occasions, and in fact was a member of that institute for several years. Most of us recognize him as, as, as a frequent local commentator in the media. And so we bring these, uh, the joint expertise and knowledge of these three persons um, to today's uh, armchair discussion as we review the Trinidad and Tobago economy. Each speaker will have initially seven minutes, uh, after which there will be a discussion among the speakers for about 10 minutes. Then we'll open the floor for 15 minutes to give you the opportunity to pose questions to the, the panel. And at the end, I will ask each of the presenters to make some closing remarks of about two minutes. So I now invite Mr. Schwartz uh, to make his seven minute presentation. Okay, good morning. good morning. Thank you very much, Professor, for the introduction. 
And thank you very much for the organizers for having considered the IDB as a sponsor for, for this important event. I'm very glad to be here. I'm happy to be here. And I think it's an interesting occasion to discuss a little bit about economic developments in the region, in the world, and specifically in Trinidad. Uh, I'll be very relatively brief. I have a, a long and detailed presentation. I'll skip most of the slides, and I'll concentrate basically on three or four, just to make a, an interesting point, I hope. Uh, but I wanted to bring this presentation, given that this is a university, and I, and I hope that all of you and students in particular will have an opportunity to take a look at the presentation in detail because I think there are many interesting figures and ideas that deserve a little bit of, of thinking. Um, so at some point in my career, I was also a professor at the university, so it's always good to be back to academics, and I'll try to emphasize uh, in interesting points that I guess students can take home uh, not overwhelmed with many ideas, but perhaps, as professors know, maybe one has to be really clear on two, three ideas, and then the student can take those and, and think a little bit about those more closely. So very briefly, um, international economic outlook, a little bit on the Caribbean, and some co uh, policy recommendations and, and conclusions. Um, an interesting challenge, I would say, for the whole region, the Caribbean region in particular, is that growth has been very low. We have some countries that have barely grown in a decade. Others have grown a little bit more, specifically the case of Trinidad. The last two years have been of a recession, and now with a little bit more of a benign international environment, so the prospects for growth are coming back again to, to the country. Uh, I would say that the region, the Caribbean in general, has basically three challenges, and those are kind of enumerated in, in the bold letters. The first one I mentioned is growth, is very low. When you have growth that is so low for so long a time, so then the economies are exposed, and all the weaknesses you have are much more evident. When the economy is growing, people are employed, so you can go on for some time, even if you have weaknesses in your economy. But when growth is very low or, or is basically non-existent, so all the weaknesses in the economy are kind of obvious and evident, and it becomes much more difficult for policymakers to move ahead. Another important element I would like to underscore is the necessity for the region in general for fiscal consolidation. Um, some economies, like this one, uh, are heavily dependent on the energy sector. Um, when times are good, so things move okay, so things progress, the government is able to spend, people are employed, and more or less the welfare state functions adequately. When things go wrong, external situation basically, so the economy slows down, and the weaknesses I, I referred to previously are again revealed. And the third point is the social challenges. You are well aware of crime, poverty, inequality, and low educational and health achievements. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to skip most of the slides, but hopefully some of you will have the opportunity to take a look at those later on. Uh, in terms of global growth, I want to emphasize a little bit the region in the context of the global situation. So global growth is returning somewhat. The latest uh, forecast for growth are somewhat above 3.5% for this year and for 2018. Uh, we have seen the U.S. economy growing relatively okay. We have seen interesting developments in Europe, in Asia, India, China. So all of those are good news for the Caribbean region. Why? Because, well, these economies depend on external situations. So external situations have an impact on commodity prices, and the external environment has also important repercussions on the service sector, tourism, tourists come to the region from Europe, from the United States, 
remittances from other countries come to the region. So if the, growth, if the world economy is growing, so that's certainly good news for the region. So we are seeing a little bit of an upswing in growth, but at the same time, we have some political and economic uncertainties. Uh, well, we know tensions in the Korean Peninsula. We have seen some protectionist policies all over the world. Um, so there are some risks in, in, in the environment. Monetary policy in some of the advanced economies has been relatively easy, so that has also created some risks in the financial markets. And at the end of the day, as I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, the economies in the Caribbean are relatively small. And even if you do things right, so you are exposed to whatever happens outside. And this region particularly, as you are well aware, is particularly prone to natural disasters and climate change. And there are some interesting figures I'll show you very briefly on, on that as we, as we move along. Um, one of the main messages I, I would like to give you is that the fact that these economies are relatively small and heavily dependent on commodities or the world's growth scenario, at the end of the day, uh, long-term growth is basically determined by what happens at home. So we could have a prolonged period of growth because energy prices are relatively high in the world because growth demand is, is high. Um, my time is up, so. <laughs> Um, so I'll try to, to, to wrap up a couple of messages. So one is the one I was just telling you, whatever happens at home is extremely relevant for medium and long-term growth. So we could have a positive external scenario or we could have a negative external scenario. And depending on that, the situation in the economy is drastically affected. But whatever happens at home in terms of fundamentals instead of fiscal reform instead of monetary policy reform in terms of central bank independence, in, of, in terms of institutions, in terms of the judicial system, corruption, and so on, is what at the end of the, of the road basically determines the wealth and the welfare of nations. So this is an interesting comment I wanted to give you. There are a couple of figures I wanted to show you on the challenges related to, to weather which I think are particularly relevant for this region. So this figure basically covers more than 50 years of tropical storms. And every line you see is a tropical storm that has hit the region. Trinidad and Tobago is a little bit below, and of course you have had your share, but if you compare those to the other parts of the Caribbean, so there is really nothing we can do. So this is geography and this is nature. Uh, and there are some numbers, interesting numbers, of the probability of a hurricane striking a particular economy. So Jamaica, for example, has a 25% probability that a, a hurricane would strike the, the country in a given year. Trinidad and Tobago, less than 10%. So these are interesting numbers because even if we do our homework at home, we can always be hit by an external dramatic scenario like a hurricane or a slowdown in economic activity in the world. So the basic message I want to leave you with, and we can elaborate a little bit more at the very end of, of, of the talk, is that we need to do our homework in terms of fiscal, in terms of monetary, in terms of institutions. So I'll stop here and I'll come back later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Swartz. I now invite Dr. Roger Hussein to make his initial presentation. Good morning. I have seven minutes, so all protocol observes. <clears throat> I would like to start off where Moses left off, which is with idiosyncratic shocks. Uh, I, I am of the view that a substantive amount of the slow economic growth or low economic growth in China and Tobago, of the poor economic performance, of the fiscal performance, and even the current account non-energy 
trade balance is idiosyncratic. It is an account of our own doing or misdoing. Um, so that, yes, the price of oil did fall from $100 to about $50. Yes, the price of gas did fall a bit. And yes, the production of crude oil did fall. But we still produce around 250 million barrels of oil and gas equivalent per annum. As compared to Antigua and Barbuda, which produces none, Dominica, which produces none, St. Lucia, which produces none, Grenada, which produces none, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which produces none. So we have created a situation where we have hung our hat where our hands cannot reach. And therefore, in my view, a significant amount of the dilemma and problem within the economy is because of the inability to properly manage, in one form or the other, the resource rents and the associated flows of having an abundance of natural resources. And this is still 250 million barrels of oil and gas equivalent is still fairly large. And we seem to have adopted a strategy in which, you know, I, I watched the game last night with, with, with I, I must refer to, to Messi scoring a hat trick uh, last night with Ecuador on, on at high altitude. And, and um, he, he was able to pull, pull Argentina into the finals. He, I think they are now ranked third in, 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 in Camibol. And the, they would probably have gotten through to the finals, but the dependence on Messi remains. And it reminds me of Trian Tobago. I, I kept watching that game and kept thinking about how we are only pushing Angelin and Juniper and Chuck and these various things. And yes, we will get a bleep for a period of time as we did in Ecuador and, and Argentina would now qualify. But the real test comes with the remaining teams in Russia. The real asset test comes then. And would, would Messi be able to take Argentina all the way? I don't think so. We need other people like Di Maria and whatnot to pull their weight. And similarly, whilst Angelin and Chuck and these various projects will give us uh, some surge in, in natural gas output on which we seem to be unable to move away from, in fact, I think 80%. 90% of the midterm review and 80% of the currently red budget focused on the energy sector, which is not what we need. We know that Messi is good. We know he has the capacity to deliver. If we could get Di Maria and some of these other people to deliver, then, then I am a fan of Argentina. Then Argentina would reach very far. Similarly, if we know that the energy sector can produce some goods, we know that. But the real test of development in this country boils down to how is it, how can we triple non-energy sector exports within the next five years? How do we reduce the average propensity to import from 53% to about 35%? We have an income level today of about 148 billion, and in 2006, we had the same level of, of, of income. Yet still, our average propensity to import today is 53%, and in 2007, it was around 35%. We need to look at those numbers and see where we could recalibrate it. Transfers and subsidies, we have this great hesitation to move it. And it remains a significant absorber of government total expenditure today as compared to 2006. And there seems to be an inability or a great hesitation to look at transfers and subsidies and see where we can cut. Having said that, the Minister of Finance has to be significantly commended for, for running a budget at 50.4 billion again. It could have been lower. I, 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 one of the things we need to give him credit for is in terms of what money can buy. This was one of the lowest budgets in the last 12 years, so I think he needs to be commended for that. However, we need to do better on the fiscal side, running 12 billion that was in deficit last year, and already announcing approximately $5 billion for this year, but show the debt approximately by the end of 2018 to over $100 billion, which I think is, is absolute nonsense. The, the other factors that did, wasn't mentioned at all in the budget, and, and in a sense, in that regard, it, 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 was, it, it had a lackadaisical element in my mind, is the labor force participation rate has fallen to about 59.8% as compared to 87% in countries like Ireland. And unless we take some pronounced effort over the next five years to lift the labor force participation rate up to about 75%, we would remain uh, working significantly within 
the possible production boundaries for this economy. And with a murder rate tottering close to 500, which rational firm, small business person, etc., would want to significantly invest or increase investment in an environment in which the murder rate continues to be growing. Since 2005, we have killed approximately 1% of the labor force. And if the average age of the average person murdered is 29 years, it means on an, we are losing 31 years in terms of labor time from people murdered. And we need to look at that. It was not even mentioned in any serious way in the budget. But we will continue to stand here and talk as long as we are alive about the murder rate and other things like this, unless we take drastic action. And one of the things we seem very hesitant in this country to do is to take hard, drastic action when it is needed. We have an economic activity level in 2017 as we speak, and already we have seen the 2017 real GDP growth listed as minus 2.3, with 2016 at minus 6 being the worst economic performance since 1983. The fiscal deficit was the worst in nominal terms since 1955. The current account balance was the worst since 1984. And these things don't seem to, to really hit us as hard as they should. Uh, my time is up. I just wanted to say those few things to you all. And within the conversation, I will try to raise a few more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. I now invite Dr. Anthony Gonzalez to make his initial presentation. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I initially prepared something on the region, that is to try to look at um, you know, what is the economic outlook for the region. Uh, and, but I will try to make some adjustments to say, say a bit more about uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Now, the first point I want to make is that when you look throughout the region, you find that growth is relatively too small. We are falling way below the, the, the world average, and we are also falling way below the average for other small countries. I, I have the figures somewhere in my presentation. Um, but certainly, um, we are not doing well in terms of growth. And this has very serious implications. Uh, and you find as a commodity, commodity economy, we do well over certain cycles, and then we come to uh, a point where we go into a slum as we are right now, and you find that um, if you didn't manage the, the boom properly, you're going to be in trouble now. So Trinidad, like the commodity countries in the Caribbean, Guyana, Belize, uh, Suriname, for instance, they're not doing very well. Suriname and Belize in particular are not faring very well. Guyana is doing a little better because it has a little more um, diversified commodity basket, and as a result, it has fared a little better um, this year or last year. But it fell, its growth fell below what it was the, um, the previous year. The growth is also not inclusive. That is to say, the growth is not sufficient enough to really take care of problems of inequality, problems of poverty, problems of unemployment. So that you find that um, um, we are not solving these problems as quick enough as we need to, as we need to do. Trinidad has not been growing fast enough, in, a, in my view, to be able to, to, to solve these problems, even though we have a fair amount of income that allows us to you know, give a lot of social handouts and so forth. We do not have what is the most important thing, in my view. We do not have resilience. We do not have long-term sustainable growth. And this is important because of the fact that not only to solve the problems that I just mentioned, which would be inequality and poverty and unemployment and so forth, but we, do not, we are not achieving the kind of competitiveness and the kind of diversification that we need to achieve in order for us to be able to sustain growth over a long period of time. If you look at the World um, Economic Report um, on global competitiveness, you would find that we are slipping. Uh, and, and we are slipping here. Most of us in the region are slipping. Barbados used to be the, the highest one, but Barbados recently has dropped significantly. Trinidad, I saw a report saying that Trinidad had climbed a bit because of the recognition of higher education. But when you look at the global competitive index overall, you see Trinidad has gone down to about 95. 
I checked it last night, and certainly it is not doing well. Now, you need to have that kind of flexibility, that kind of structural capacity to really sustain growth over time, and you're not seeing that evolving in Caribbean economies. Probably the Dominican Republic might be the only one, but even so, you have some question marks there, to, uh, there, there that you need to note. Well, Roger mentioned the current account deficit. We see, for instance, that Trinidad turning now into a deficit. It used to be a surplus country on the current account with its large oil and gas exports and so on. It is now turning into a deficit and joining some of the other Caribbean neighbors. I think we have to be certainly concerned about that. Um, Jamaica managed to eliminate its, its um, double-digit current account deficit uh, uh, for the first time in a, in a few years. And Guyana is experiencing its first um, surplus um, in, in decades. And the current account deficit is something that plagues most Caribbean countries that tend to import uh, more than it exports. Foreign reserve situation, we know what that is like. We see Trinidad dropping from $12 uh, billion US dollars in reserves now down to about, about, about nine, uh, which means we have less import cover. We're still better than most of the other Caribbean countries. Um, you have countries like Barbados, Bahamas, Suriname, where they are below the global benchmark which would be about three months of import cover. We are not there yet, but we are fastly, we are fa we're quickly getting there, and we have to be very, very um, watchful in terms of how we handle that. Um, fiscal stability, Roger mentioned, um, made that point about managing our, 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 our fiscal situation, and he talked about fiscal um, consolidation, our colleague from the IDB, it was something very important. Um, we have been running deficits, and we continue to run deficits, and we see where these deficits are taking us. They are taking us in, into indebtedness. We have risen, um, we are now something like about 63% 60, of GDP, up from about 45% just a few years ago. So we're hitting danger zone. The average for the Cari in, the, in the Caribbean is something like about 70 or 73% average um, debt to GDP. It's, it's horrendous in, in places like Barbados, where it's 145 percent, and in Jamaica, where it's 125 percent. So you can just imagine the amount of your budget. I think in Jamaica, it's probably about 80, 83 percent of your budget going in interest rate payments every year. So what is left for productive development is very small. Um, so the debt situation is worsening, and I think certainly uh, we have to take stock of that and see how quickly we can begin now to reverse in that because we don't want to put that burden on you, you the younger generation here. You will have to shoulder that long when people like me are gone. <laughs> so the outlook doesn't look very good. Um, we have, as Roger said, and I fully agree with him, we, we have not managed properly our resources. I keep thinking all the time, and this is not news to me because all in the 80s, um, in these conferences that we started like this, we were talking about adjustment and, 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 and stabilization and so forth. And the same problems you see re re reoccurring. In those days, it was not fashionable to talk about stabilization and adjustment. That was seen as an IMF thing. Today, it is much more acceptable and we, we, we can discuss it rationally and so forth. But certainly, um, we, we have to accept the fact that the, the, the economy with the greatest volatility as a small country is a petroleum economy. Uh, small economies are generally volatile, and for them to, to recover from, that, from those downturns, they have to have a certain kind of resilience. Uh, we find that, for instance, um, in oil economies, the slums could be pretty serious. I think we spent how many was nine or 10 years in the last slum before we actually came out of it somewhere towards the end of the, 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 the 90s. So you could imagine if we continue going as we are, we're going to be there for a long time. So the economic outlook is not good. You could have seen from the minister's budget, he was panicking. And I said this in a commentary on the, on the radio. Um, for the first time, he realized that his fiscal strategy was not working. It is based on the oil price going up to $50 and above. If that doesn't happen, he's back where He's back to the same situation this year, and it is, it is going to be even worse. He's now realizing that you have to develop the non-energy sector, and as Roger said quite rightly, that sector has to perform in order to compensate for the losses in the energy sector. So I only have five minutes. I'll be happy to take any questions that you have, and we can continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. So we've had 
two opportunities at looking at the regional outlook. Uh, and we had a uh, focus on the Trinidad and Tobago uh, situation by Dr. Hussein. Uh, and we even had an opportunity of, of, of looking at the Caribbean, the context of uh, global growth. Uh, I want to now invite the members of the, of the panel to discuss further some, some burning issues. And certainly one that has come out in two of the presentations has to do with the non-energy uh, sector, uh, the growth of exports from that sector. Dr. Hussein spoke about the need to possibly triple that growth. Um, I would ask him to begin by elaborating on some strategies which might be adopted in order to achieve that kind of outcome. So thank you, Chair. A number of things come to mind. I, I tend to be a very simple economist, so I look at these things very simply. So I would take the top 20 energy exporting countries in the world, and I would look among this top, the, well, in fact, all the energy exporting countries in the world and pick the top 10 amongst those in terms of mo being most diversified. And then for each of those top 10 countries, I would look at 10 policies that they did to help diversify their economy. So that would be 100 policies. And out of those 100 policies, I would pick the top 15 that best, best fits a, a 1.3 million uh, small economy. And I would try to implement these policies in a serious way and within a particular time period. And to add one more, I would look at our own non-energy ex export sector. I would take the top 50 non-energy exporting firms. I would call them together to a meeting, and I would ask them what are the obstacles that they face in trying to double their export capacity and in so doing increase export revenues. I would collate all these obstacles, and I would work via the, the Ministry of Trade and the various policymakers to bring these obstacles as close together, as close to zero as possible, so that within a well-defined time period, instead of using an interministerial team to decide on who wins a shark tank on planting seeds, some type of competition, I would use that interministerial team, a high-profile team, to go after tripling non-energy exports within a two-year period. So those will be the two points I would show out to start the conversation. I don't know if Anthony would want to add to that. Yeah, well, I think you, 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 you probably have to start with what exists, what is on the ground. And I would say, to some extent, I see some of this in the, in the, in the last budget. That is to say, you have non-energy sectors, like uh, the, the marine industry, the auto industry, and other aspects of the marine industry. You have uh, the creative industries, cultural industries, and so forth. You, you have the fi financial services, which is not going really too bad in terms of developing an export, export capability. You have, uh, you have uh, about, you have about six or seven of them. I don't recall all of them at this point in time. But I believe this is where you start. And you look for the fact, you look where there's lack of capacity, where there's insufficient capacity, and how you can boost that capacity, and what are the prospects that they, they start to export. In tourism, of course, is an interesting one. And we have been very, very late on that question, and that has a whole history by itself. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed when I look around and see how slow we are moving on that. Uh, I, I, I see where you be. Somebody is interested in, in hotel development in Tobago, and you have to decide well, how you get the land for them and so on. And I compare this, for example, with Cuba, where they prepare the land and everything like that, and they invite international investors to come in and make a pay. And I'm appalled to see, for instance, recently, where you talk about, about, about the government building the hotel and asking standards to manage it. I would have thought, for instance, that like all the Caribbean islands, the government is short of cash today. You would want the foreign investor to come in and handle that. Why, why the government is getting involved in that? We saw what happened to the government getting involved in bank building up and so forth. It will stay involved here as long as, 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 as people manage that hotel because it's the government, it's the, the, the public treasury. So I'm not happy with the way in which we have gone about diversifying. There's a lot more. We have tremendous potential in my view in tourism. If you think of tourism 
as a multi destination phenomenon between these two islands and being get on the circuit to move people around and so forth. So there are tremendous possibilities with what is already there and how we expand it. And I think you have to look at what we can develop. This is what they talk about the fourth revolution, the digital economy, innovation and all these things. That they have a much more longer time horizon. And we have to go about putting in place a number of things to get these things off the ground. But that will basically be my approach to towards diversifying the non energy sector. Yeah. I think your mic might not be on. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Yes. Schwartz to, to... Yes, thank you. For his thoughts on this one. Is this one on? Yes, yes you are. On. Well, I guess the three of us kind of are in agreement with, with the diagnostic, and the challenge is how to move ahead and diversify the economy. I think it's on. It's on. How to move ahead and try to diversify the economy. And unfortunately, uh, there are no easy solutions, and more so when the economy is so dependent on the energy sector as it has been. So when you have good times, so it's relatively easy for policymakers simply to enjoy the boom and hope for the best. And sometimes you do marginal uh, modifications in policy that are in the right direction. But I would basically recommend that we need an emphatic and decisive uh, policy, policy initiative that would last for several years regardless of what really happens in the energy sector. Um, I'm from Mexico, and I worked in the public sector in Mexico for many, many years. The problems I see in Trinidad now are very similar to the problems that Mexico faced many years ago. Mexico is still heavily dependent on oil, but not as much as it used to be. Unfortunately for Mexico, most of the changes in policy were the result of crisis, economic crisis, and then you have a crisis, so you have to start building from scratch again. But at some point, nobody in Mexico anticipated an opening up of the economy. Uh, now, everyone talks about NAFTA again because of the protectionist voices we are hearing from the North. Uh, but when NAFTA was negotiated in the early 1990s, all the worries were in Mexico. How on earth are we going to diversify our economy? And how on earth are we going to open our borders to the most, the biggest economy in the world that they are going basically to wipe out all of, all of, all of our industry? But well, there was a calendar, and firms knew what was coming, and there were incentives, and there were subsidies, and there were fiscal and monetary policies. So as time went by, the economy became much more flexible. Same with the exchange rate system in Mexico. So Mexico for many years had a fixed exchange rate. Nobody thought about the possibility of abandoning the exchange rate system. We had to abandon it because the central bank basically ran out of reserves. So there was no alternative. And we had a huge curve. And when the Mexican peso started to float, everyone at that time believed that this was temporary. As soon as the situation would stabilize itself again, Mexico would go back to some type of fixing. Maybe perhaps not a fixed exchange rate, but a band with some fluctuations and so on and so forth. But then, well, we learn how to live with some volatility in the market, and markets learn how to expect movement. So what I would recommend is we have to have an open mind and try to see how to bring a little bit more of flexibility to this economy. Now, as I mentioned in my brief introduction, uh, the world scenario seems a little bit better. So it might be a good time to start trying to have a medium-term objective in terms of fiscal policy, monetary policy, how to deal with all the government transfers to public entities, how to deal with subsidies, make all these allocations a little bit more efficient. So that would take, hopefully, Trinidad and Tobago in a path that moves a little bit more in that direction. And if you are consistent in this type of policy along the years, so things are going to be better. Okay. Dr. Okay. Hussain, you want to add anything more to that? Um, no, I would wait for uh, come okay. uh, The last speaker made reference to uh, increasing efficiencies. Uh, when we look at, at, at uh, 
most most recent budget presentation, um, do we see do we see some initiatives um, that would take us down into that direction? So, <clears throat> for the benefit of the students, y is equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus n. So we look at consumption. What was done with consumption in the budget? We saw some compression of consumption via the fuel subsidy, <clears throat> and we saw the minister go after uh, every possible tax he could find where it weren't existing before. He tried really hard to bring some taxes uh, uh, into the radar, and, and so that was good. Consumption would decrease a bit. Investment really wasn't given any, any, any significant support. The shark tanks thing wouldn't work because a chunk, from the time you hear interministerial team, people are going to think it's political. Some proportion of the population are going to think they are not going to be serviced, and that is problems. Government expenditure, well, government out of the pit here now, they have no money, they're running huge fiscal deficit. So it really, to me, boils down to X minus M. I didn't see any significant change to anything that could stimulate the non-energy ex export sector, nor did I see any significant thing that could reduce the average propensity to import. So our current account balance, expect, except via the, the shock that comes to exogenous uh, influences our oil price, which is not likely to happen because of shale, or because of the improvement with silicon and, and, and the various natural gas improvements, would see a favorable movement only in that avenue. And again, so we have we, the fifth or the sixth paragraph in the budget speech said that, said that we are moving from an old paradigm to a new paradigm. And we then went ahead after that paragraph to read the old paradigm. Focus on energy, try to make some more money, let, to use an analogy with Lara, let Lara go in decrease and make some runs and don't worry about any other batsman on the team. So we just focused on energy, it's going to fail. Unless we bring the budget in closer alignment with the plan, we are going to remain at the end of the year, in quote 2018, we are going to be sitting here, and if the minister did, and if the minister did, and if the minister did, so, thanks, Roger. In the interest of time, um, I know we'd want to to engage the other two panelists further, but I think it's time for you, the members of the audience, to to take your opportunities to pose questions. I think there are some microphones available. Yes. So, if you please raise your hand, and we will go with the first round of questions to the panelists. Who wants to go first? So there's one in front. Is there another person who would like to go with a second question or a comment, Dr. Conrad? And do we have a, a, a third question or comment from the, from the audience? OK, you go with your first. Good morning. Uh, my question is for the entire panel. So. Um, in the context of the discussion um, in terms of the budget and the dependence on energy revenues and the need to diversify away from the energy sector, I would like to know whether anyone here would, have to, uh, would like to share an opinion in terms of our Heritage and Stabilization Fund and the rules which governs our Heritage and Stabilization Funds in terms of using windfalls during times of boom periods and also in terms of drawing down on savings during the times of bus periods um, and how these windfalls, how these drawdowns are used and directed towards developmental priorities for the country. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, for our panelists, for the discussion so far. I think my question is a little bit similar, but I, I, I want to pick out a few words used by a number of the panelists, and I think Dr. Schwartz mentioned consistency in fiscal policy. Another uh, term mentioned was that is uh, efficiency. I think we lose a lot of efficiency. So I guess my question is in, in, in regionally, not just nationally. What are your thoughts in, in terms of our, con our continued approach in pro-cyclical management rather than using some type of counter-cyclical approach? And I know that ironically, the last slide that I saw before they switched over to the banner was that of the issue of the hurricanes. And I think with our continued pro-cyclical approach, 
we would find ourselves in the event of any type of natural disaster in a very, very unfortunate place where we would not have the resources to pull ourselves out of it and would have to look outward very quickly rather than look internally. So just some, some thoughts on the consistency and how we can approach it in a consistent way as well as address the issue of moving to counter-cyclical rather than pro-cyclical. Thank you. And there's a third question here. Thank you, good morning. Um, I have two issues. One with respect to the issue of diversification. <clears throat> the, the range of potentially low-hanging fruits, the creative industries, the maritime services, the yachting, etc., etc. We've identified these potential sectors for now well over 20 years. And we're still talking about them in the future tense. More than that, we've spent millions of dollars through special purpose vehicles to promote non-energy diversification. But here we are today and still talking about it in the future tense. So that I don't know if saying it, just saying it can make it happen. And I hear Roger's suggestions, which are macro level suggestions, which is to look at best practices and try to bring it, bring it here. But what I have found in terms of looking at diversification is that the macro approach in terms of just bringing policies that, that are umbrella of policies across the board have proven to not be so successful. Diversification really needs to be approached from a clustering um, um, perspective where we look at what areas that we potentially can develop and I share the view that the shark tank type of one firm at a time approach will fail because again, in many countries that have tried to incentivize investment at the firm level, it does not contribute to diversification. So the incentives, in my view, need to be at a cluster level. You know, there are a number of clusters, and, and yes, the yachting could possibly be one. There are numerous in the agricultural sector. But the entire, and the, the whole issue of policy direction and support needs to be looked at building ecosystems of firms with supporting um, supply on the supply side with supporting policy and supporting infrastructure and institutions, institutional R&D, so that we can build ecosystems of firms, so that we can enjoy the benefit of competition and collaboration if we are to possibly address the issue of growth. And, my, 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 and if you could just talk about you know, your views on what I'm saying, I'd be appreciative. And Roger talked about the issue of the low participation rate in the labor force. If you could tell us, Roger, some things that if, if you could, what would you suggest that, we, that should be done in order to increase labor participation in, 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 in the workplace? You see, because my concern is human capital development, yes, that's great. We spent a lot of money training people, but by the end of the day, human capital development without opportunities really leads to brain drain, which is what we suffer. Thank you. Thanks very much. So we would now uh, I ask that you hold the other questions. We'll have time for a second round. And so I now open up to the panel for, for some responses to these questions. The first one had to do with the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. And I think, Ate, you might want to take this one. Yeah, well, I, I think this one is pretty straightforward. I, I, I lived before the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. I remember us arguing on the campus here that we need to have a Heritage and Stabilization Fund, and we never expected that both Heritage side and the Stabilization side would have been joined together. They should have been separated, and we know here today that they are going to finally, finally do that. So that is certainly welcome. You have to separate it. You can't just mix it, and we don't know what, you know, what you're taking out for what. Secondly, I, I, I agree that um, it should be. It doesn't make sense borrowing money if you already if you have a heritage and civilization fund. You're borrowing money to pay a lot of interest when you have resources available to you. Uh, but it, these resources should be used for more productive purposes. I don't want to see these resources being used to pay salaries and do a lot of recurrent spending and, and, and so forth. So that's why I will have difficulty with it. I could understand if it's used to bridge a legitimate gap in expenditure, legit, you know expenditure that you have, uh, uh, is it tractable that you have to make, then, you know, if it's used in that sense, I have no difficulty. Um, with respect to, uh, should I go on to the other question? Sure. Um, the question of efficiency was raised, you, Martin, you raised it, and I must say that 
I look at this in the broader perspective of how you use market forces. It's not that um, I am a, a market fundamentalist, but I tend to think that we are, to some extent, a bit too dependent on state intervention. Look at all those measures the government has announced there. We set up a fund to do so and so and so, and these people could come and apply and we will allocate resources. I think a lot of that is a waste of time. We're not allowing the forces of the market to work properly. And I know there are distortions in the financial market and things like that. But the first distortion that we are starting with is on the exchange rate, in my view. We are making a serious blunder on that ex exchange rate. And we are forgetting what, what the past was like. When we start to introduce all these controls and foreign exchange, how you distort the market, prices go out of line, you create a parallel market for foreign exchange, you the foreign exchange is not allocated properly in that market to those who really need it, and you get this kind of distortion. Not to mention the fact that resources in the country are not properly allocated in the sense that uh, people should not be, because of contact, be able to import certain things. Um, if the price is right, if the price is, is raised, they should realize that they cannot import certain things. You're not getting the substitution effect, which is to say that uh, we are not, for instance, like Barbados, where we can't substitute in manufacturing and in agriculture. We have a lot of potential in agriculture. People would buy more local food if local um, agriculture is get, gets the stimulus from a devaluation. So there are a lot of issues here. About we can talk about the public sector reforms and things like that that are necessary, structural reforms that will bring more efficiency. But I think we need to let market forces drive this a bit more. Privatization something which I started articulating in the 80s and ran into a lot of trouble with, I tend to think that that is something that is still not settled in this country. The state has 60-something state enterprises. They're all losing money. Half the budget was going on transfers and subsidies, most of that going to these state enterprises that are losing money. So there's a lot of room for introducing market forces and so on, which I think will help to introduce efficiency in the system. As regards the question of counter cyclical policy, I agree that, that um, we cannot uh, be, be post-cyclical here in such a small economy because it simply means that um, our spending will uh, uh, just run down the reserves in the country. We, we're too small. We, we import too much. So we have to really be able to restrict spending in, in, times, in good times and, and, save, and save more and put ourselves in a position for when there's a, a, a downturn to be able to to, 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 to increase spending. So I tend to agree with a counter cyclical approach that is not following the, the, the normal cycles of growth and so forth. It hasn't worked pretty well in this country because we hadn't practiced it. As I mentioned, for instance, you can trace the, the problems that we have today to some extent in 2014. 2014, I argued, we had a, a conference right here. I think no, it was in the other, in the other LRC and the minister was there and I said, uh, Minister, the price of oil is going down, and um, you know, and, uh, as I'm seeing, it's, it's not going to be over fifty dollars this year. He said, "No, well, you know, the IMF and the World Bank told him it would be eighty dollars." That was in preparation for the 2015 budget. Now, if you see what happened there in 2015, the oil price dropped to forty-eight dollars a barrel, came down from over eighty dollars a barrel, and we had a budget of sixty-three, sixty-three billion dollars. Now, it is quite true, as a colleague pointed out to me, that over the years we have been spending these windfalls, and you could trace that from since the first barrel of oil came out of the ground. We, we have been doing that over the years. But, you know, in terms of the more proximate response, we could have dealt with this situation much better years ago if we were more prudent. So I tend to feel that we, we are not paying enough attention to that kind of, kind of approach. Diversification, using clusters. Cluster. Um, I think there is something in that, how many clusters there are. We have some clustering in manufacturing, in the beverage industry, and, and one or two others. They are not significant clusters. It takes a long while to bring proper clusters. And we have not been able, in a sense, to build regional clusters. So there's something to say about giving incentives to clusters where you think you already have a certain kind of capacity in there, and that it could stimulate further, further, further um, development. And we probably could focus incentives um, a, bit, a bit more there. But I tend to think that, um, and I don't particularly like the idea of picking government, picking winner, winners and identifying firms and say this particular firm can do well. I think the government has to set the broad policy framework, make sure the macroeconomic environment is, is correct, and that in, it, in itself would stimulate the firms to, to behave in a, certain, in, a, in a certain way. 
So that I tend to think that um, there's a lot of room here for us to really um, use policy more effectively in terms of trying to stimulate development. Thank you. I will leave Roger yeah, to, to yeah. answer the question. Let me go to, to Mr. Party. Schwartz first, and then I'll go to Roger. Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with what Professor Gonzalez just, just mentioned. And he covered basically all the questions. So I want to say that I'm totally supportive, 100% <laughs> of every single word you mentioned. Um, in terms of the diversification, totally agree. We need to let markets do their work. We need a smaller government. We need a less distortionary economy. However, we are in a situation where it's difficult to move in that direction. So as I mentioned before, and this is related to, 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 to the question of the professor, is that we have to be consistent in the policy making. So if we agree that government needs to be smaller, if we agree that this economy needs to be less distorted, so policy needs to move in that direction, even though it might take a long time to get there. Okay. Uh, because, well, once you are in a relatively comfortable situation, it's very difficult to, to, to change. It's very difficult to have policies. It's very difficult to get rid of some distortions. It's difficult to get rid of subsidies that might be very inefficient, but it's almost impossible to get rid of those because some sectors and some sectors of the population might be affected. But as long as you have a clear uh, aim, a clear goal, and you have policy moving in that direction, even on a piecemeal approach, I would say this is, this is the right way to go. Uh, in terms of the pro-cyclicality and the contra-cyclicality, also I agree with, with Professor Gonzalez. Uh, I'm a fan of these fiscal rules. Mm -hmm. uh, in the region, we have very few of those. Having a sovereign wealth fund is certainly one kind of a, a fiscal rule. Even having a budget, which is so obvious nowadays, it's kind of a fiscal rule because you have a commitment, you explain sectors, you explain society, how you are going to allocate revenues, how you are going to disburse expenditures. So it gives some clarity. The good thing about fiscal rules is that reduce the scope of fiscal mismanagement. So. There can always be fiscal mismanagement, but at least there is an idea, there is some certainty what's going to happen in the future. And occasionally, we have surprises and shocks and so on and so forth. So there is some flexibility in some of these rules. So you deviate significantly from the objective you have in terms of debt to GDP or in terms of a fiscal deficit. So the government is in one way or another obliged to have a path to say, well, I deviated because of this, which was not really contemplated in my programming, but I intend to get to the goal in a couple of years doing X, Y, and Z. So that type of measures are a little bit strict on occasion, but well, it really depends on what the government wants to do. So some type of certainty providing a little bit of flexibility to the government to operate would certainly work in, 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 in the right direction. So in terms of a sovereign wealth fund or a fiscal rule, so you would like, as the professor was saying, to spend a little bit more when times are bad and to save when things are moving in the right direction. So a fiscal rule can, can help a government uh, move a little bit in that direction. But as I mentioned before, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. Thank you. Roger, I'm going to give you one minute to make a contribution because I want to get a second round before yes. we, we come. I, I would wait for the second round. Okay, all right, fine. Can I invite then uh, a second round of questions? I see one to the back. There's one to the front here, two. Is there a third question to complete this second round? You may go ahead. Good day, everybody. Um, I just have a few questions. Now, I did not major in economics, but I'm going to ask it from a very layman's term point of view. Um, I didn't hear anything in the budget or among the panelists about the role of regional development, per se, in developing a country in terms of CARICOM and how our integration there might actually help us. I don't know if that's possible at all. Um, also, I think it was Dr. Hosein, Roger Hosein, that talked about reducing, we have a reluctance to reduce transfers and subsidies, and obviously that's tied to no politician wants to reduce transfers and subsidies when it will affect the poor man who affects at the end of his vote. 
But I want to know, even if we have to reduce it, where exactly is the area for this reduction? Um, also, in terms of developing the top 15 non-energy sectors, I think, again, that was Dr. Hosein that spoke about it. Um, my thing is, even if we go to them and we ask for these, um, how can we help you expand or anything like that? How would, can we end up in a place where we grow but we don't see equity? Meaning that the owners of these businesses, yes, they may be the top maybe one or two percent of the country growing, but what happens to the rest of the economy? I think we actually need to feel growth in the small and medium businesses, and what suggestions you would make for those measures to take Thank place? You. Thank you for that. Now we go to the, the other person in front. You get a microphone then, please. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you to the panelists. Um, some of my questions were either answered or asked by other participants today, so I was very encouraged to see a sort of, you know, congelling of the minds with regards to the problems we face, and it's a wonder how we can't get our policymakers to move accordingly, because some of the things I would like to ask, in particular Mr. Schwartz, and I will explain why I want his answer, but to a lesser extent Mr. Gonzalez, and if Mr. Dr. Hussain could also speak on this, is that there are certain things you would think and you would assume that we would agree on the basic economic fundamentals and the basic policy facts, and that at least in the execution, we could leave to the politics. And I think in the region as a whole, we have this dependency on government, on over-reliance on government. And I like how Dr. Mr. Gonzalez explained it in that I really believe, and it could just be my position, but the role of government is to set that policy framework and that overall environment, the macro environment, and let small firms proliferate. So what I want to ask Dr. Schwartz is that in your experience from Mexico, because what I like about the Mexico example, and again, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation because of things of size and other factors, but Mexico was also very commodity dependent, one. And then two, Mexico ventured into regional, I mean, it was more, NAFTA in particular was more concentrated on trade, so it's a bit narrower than the regional integration initiative we're doing in the, in the English-speaking Caribbean. But from a country who, has a heavy, who had a heavy, heavy commodity dependence and then had to liberalize its exchange rate regime and then enter into bigger economies and trade associations with bigger economies, what was that transition like and what were the factors that made it successful? And then negotiating with larger partners like Canada and the United States. Um, what were and how did you move the politics of it? Because as again in the region, that's another thing we face: getting past the politics and into the economic reality. So I don't know if you have any lessons from Mexico from moving from resource dependence to proper regional integration to help fuel economic development. Thank you very much. I, I go to Dr. Hussain. Um, with relation to the question on transfers and subsidies, again, so our transfers and subsidies bill for 2017, 2018 is about 26 billion. And I keep going back to 2006, 2007, which is the last period in which we had the same level of economic activity as now. And in fact, it coincides on three points. It coincides on real GDP, nominal GDP, and on GDP US dollar per capita. So I would go back to 2007, and I would look at what constituted transfers and subsidies then. And you would see it was about $10 billion lower. So at the same level of income in two different periods, you have $10 billion more. Yes, uh, arguably about $1, 2000000000 billion maybe because of inflation. So it could be $8 billion more in terms of, 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 of actual money. And I would look at this $8 billion, and I would see where it was added and what I could remove. So I would take a very simple approach. At the same level of income, I'm arguing that you, I should have the same level of transfers and subsidies. And mind you, in 2007, the unemployment rate was about 7%. And to use some, some infamous words in this country, nobody was rioting or nobody was fussing at that level. And so I would take a view of the transfers and subsidies from that perspective and I would cut them out one by one and bring it back to parity in terms of what we can afford. What, we, what was done, in fact, was we, 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 we tried to preserve transfers and subsidies and let the budget deficit adjust as it may. In similar regard, the, the average price of crude oil in the time period 2016 to 2017 was $49, with a standard deviation of, of about $2.32 that gave you $52 in sum. Or if you took um, 2017 alone, it would have been about 
$46 with a standard deviation of about $6, which gave you again $52 in sum. So what the minister actually did is he went on the upper bound of the mean plus the standard deviation, so he created very little wiggle room. He used the IMF as a justification for going at that level, but if one were to look at the Economic Intelligence un uh, Unit, or the EIA, or uh, JP Morgan, you would see that they actually went in the 40s, and so any slip, even marginal, would make the fiscal deficit go beyond the approximate five billion we had. And in terms of the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, I think we are drawing close to the point, and if we had only done this, you know, if we had only done this in 2002 or 2003, we would have had 40 billion US dollars put away. I, I know it has no value in saying it, but it agonizes me because I have three young kids, and some of the money that was wasted is mine. So, but if I would, I think this economy has to move closer to a strategy of putting away all the energy re revenues we generate into the Heritage and Stabilization Fund and using some proportion of the interest generated on the fund on an annual basis to contribute to the budgetary purpose. That way, we are guaranteed that the fund would grow, other things constant, and at the same point in time, it would make a budgetary uh, contribution. The point I think Malini was getting at, and I quite agree, is that if we, are to ex if we need to extract from the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, I think it should be for capital development, for shifting the supply curve of the economy rightwards. In fact, we are using it for recurrent expenditure. And that is the hallmark, and, 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 and it implies that we have great resistance to cut government expenditure to levels commensurate with, with which we can afford. And if you'd allow me one more minute to comment. Yeah, there's the, there's the question of the labor force yeah, that's participation. What I was comment. Yeah. The numerator in the labor force participation rate uh, is the, the labor force, and the denominator is the non-institutionalized institutionalized population. So I'm not in, seeing India again. Yes. Anyway, right. but to increase the, the numerator, I would simply increase the, labor, the, the retirement age from 60 to 65, and I would use the life expectancy in this, this country that has increased <coughs> over the last 15 years as a reasonable basis to do that. I, I would also say that rather than bringing foreign nationals into my country to occupy jobs, and I'm in no way, let the media be clear, referring to the people from Dominica here, because that's a humanitarian intervention, but the other people that come into this country and take up our jobs, I would increase the labor force uh, retirement age, and I would also go aggressively at the murder rate. Now, some snide remarks were made recently when some commentators said, if we could reduce the, labor for the murder rate from 500 to 200, and the politician said, but why not reduce it to zero? The thing is, we can't even go near zero. So if we could bring it to 200, the last time we had 200 would have been about 2001. We would still take a chance to walk the world after 6 p.m. For the present, when it's 5.59 and 5.55, you call your chair inside and you lock all the doors. So certainly, we, that, that is a strategy we could consider. And if we cannot, of our own accord, for some reason bring the murder rate down, except for the year of the curfew, it has been going up, then ask for help. The murder rate has seriously compromised our mobility, our ability to run a shift from 7 p.m. in the night to 7, to, to 7 a.m. in the morning, and therefore it needs drastic action. If I were to do a poll of everybody here, I did it at the Sawa Business Association, I asked everybody present to randomly write down and independently write down the top five concerns they have that they would have liked to hear in the budget. And more than 90% of the people had as their first option reducing the murder rate. We are plain. We are, we, I can't help but say we are plain. It was not even mentioned once in, in the budget speech. Thank you. I want to go to Mr. Schwartz in terms of the, the Mexican experience. Yes. Uh, well, very briefly, and I think this is a, an excellent question, um, not only Mexico, but many countries in Latin America, I would say, have in the past, some still, relied too much on government. So it's not something particular to the Caribbean or to Trinidad. So this is the way it is. And as I mentioned before, I guess it takes a decisive action from the government to try to move in the opposite direction. So the role of the government would be to say, well, we need the private sector to take over. So what should be the role of the government 
in order to make that happen. So what is interfering in the process for the private sector to operate more efficiently? So if there are distortions, so we have to get rid of the distortions. Now, it's easier to say it than to do it, and that's why we are stuck in a, in a difficult situation. But I guess the role of the government in a medium-term horizon would be to try to smooth those rough edges. Every time you get rid of a subsidy, every time you get rid of a distortion, so there are some sectors, some segments of the population that are affected. So one has to learn how to live with that and how to offset the, 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 the downward situation that a specific segment of the society is experiencing. So, and there are many examples. For example, going to development, all these cash transfers to the poor. So, if they attend school, so the government gives them a subsidy, so a cash transfer. So, it started in Mexico, now it's all over the place in, in Latin America. If a mother takes the kids to the doctor and she, saw, she, she shows the certificate that the vaccination took place, so there is kind of a subsidy to the family that she took the kids. So it has a cost, it has a fiscal cost, but at the same time tries to offset the difficulty in dealing with policy measures. So if one has a medium-term horizon, so the government should try to to, to amend the distortions so that the private sector can improve its participation in the economy and, as I mentioned before, let the market work. So at the end of the day, the government is not to say, well, we should stimulate this specific industry. Let the market decide which industry should be stimulated according to the price mechanism, and the government should try to smooth all those variations. Now, in terms of your specific question on the Mexican situation. Trade liberalization in Mexico was a long process. NAFTA with the US and Canada was kind of the culmination, but it took part many, many years before that. So opening up the economy, little by little, Mexico became part of the general agreement of tariff and trade that was a long predecessor of the World Trade Organization. So. So it was a, a process that took many, many years. But even so, and after NAFTA, Mexico signed agreements with almost every region in the world. But the most important one for Mexico, because of the closeness, is the one with the United States and Canada. Because, well, we have this huge border and the most powerful market in the world on the other side. So that's certainly the most important one. And that's why there are some jitters now in the negotiations with now the roles totally opposite. So the US uh, is kind of claiming that Mexico is taking advantage of, of the United States. But when the discussion took place, as I mentioned before, in the early 1990s, it was completely the opposite. And politically, it was very difficult to, to, to move ahead because some sectors had to reinvent themselves completely. Many industries totally disappeared and they transformed into something else. But this was a process that I would say was long planned with a lot of a timetable that people anticipated. Five years from now, seven years from now, imports are going to be relatively cheaper on this particular good. So if you are a producer and you produce something that it's going to become extremely cheap five years down the road, so you have some time to decide what to do. So even you become more efficient in what you do, or even you decide to close down this factory and start doing something else. So at the end of the day, it takes comparative advantage in agriculture for Mexico, in the maquila industry, so these industries that were established close to the border on the Mexican side, and they became specialized in some type of manufactures. You know, labor force in Mexico is relatively cheap in comparison to the US. Many American workers didn't go on to do specific activities that Mexicans were extremely eager to do. So at the end of the day, it's a process, and the economy kind of adapts itself according to the incentives, to the laws, to the new rules of the land that are in place. So this is the situation, and I guess it takes many, many years for an economy to transform, it, to 
tran transform itself from where it was. And Mexico is still dependent on oil. So it's not that we simply forgot about oil. When the price of oil is high, so we also have the booms. And Mexico also has this oil stabilization fund, and so on and so forth, but not as dramatic as it used to be in the past, and as it seems to be the case. Thank you. And I want uh, Anthony to answer that question with respect to what could we look to the regional integration movement to assist us with in, this, in, in our situation? Yes, I think, I think although it, 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 it was not mentioned um, in, the, in the budget, I think um, regional integration remains very critical for a country like this. Our manufacturers depend significantly on the regional market. And if the regional market does well, and I should not only say our manufacturers, our service industry is, is, is showing a growing dependence on the regional market. Our professional services, our construction services, and so forth, you see it where uh, the regional market becomes important for them. So that if the region does well, and uh, we are seeing, for example, our biggest market in the region is Jamaica. Jamaica is, is now you know, raising its head above water a bit. Uh, we have to be very cautious when I'm talking here because we have <laughs> very sort of stagnant growth over the years. But you begin to see a transformation taking place, and they're now predicting about 2% growth of growth in Jamaica. So that if Jamaica grows well, we do well because we're able to really export more, for Jamaica, more to Jamaica. The tourism-dependent countries have been doing much better in the last couple of years because of the upswing in the developed countries. In the one, once the markets in North America and in Europe do well, the tourist economies do well, and that opens up possibilities for us and us in this country here to export more for them. Of course, there's the hurricane. Hurricane has affected Dominica and Antigua and Barbuda to some extent, but by and large, um, the regional market seems to be a slightly a little more buoyant. For instance, Guyana. Guyana has been doing consistently well over the last four or five years with its commodity exports. Um, it, it has shown that a kind of steady growth, and now it's, it's its potential growing in the oil industry. We can see a significant market arising right next to us, which, to which we have had long traditional ties, and where we could do a lot more business in the future. Our energy uh, service suppliers and so forth can do a lot more in Guyana, as well as Suriname, which also has that growing potential and so on. So the regional market is very important, and I'm happy to see that things are picking up in the region. They're picking up very slowly, but to some extent, they're better than where they were some years ago, and especially during the uh, 2009 uh, financial crisis. They have come a long way from, from, there, from that point. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we're out of time. I'm sure there are a lot more questions that, uh, that you had to pose to the panel. But in the interest of completing the, the program for the rest of the day and to get your lunch so that you could come back here refreshed and, and, and ready to, to participate in the, in the discussion of this afternoon, we must bring this panel to an end. I want you to show appreciation to our panelists, please, by giving them a round of applause. And thank you very much for, for, for your participation.